My sermon passage is Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord. Be May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. The end. <laughs> I just threw Hereta a real curve. <laughs> How else do you start a sermon with an ending? This passage, the last three verses of Romans, is a doxology. It's an ending. So why a doxology? Why an ending? And why now? Well, because it pretty much summarizes the entire reason for the season. The enigma of God's love. The riddle of the incarnation. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but is now disclosed through Jesus Christ. The timing is perfect. After four Sundays of Advent and four candles lit for hope, peace, love, and joy, now it's all over but the crying. The crying of a baby in a manger. The revelation of the mystery. This evening, some of us will be here again to hear the word, very short word, sing some hymns, share the holy meal, and lift the cup of kindness, the cup of salvation, which Christ poured out for all of us. So this morning, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, just hours before Christmas Eve, I want to take time to take a breath, to take the long view. We will drink of the cup tonight. But now, a toast to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. A toast. A toast is praise. A toast is a call to a gathering of people to raise a glass and drink in honor of someone. Some people assume that a proper toast takes alcohol. Maybe so, historically. But what it really requires is a community coming together, at least for a few minutes, in goodwill and in honor of someone, to bless someone. To toast someone is to bless them. I've shared a few toasts in my life at weddings to grooms, and I've toasted good friends who died. Too rarely have I toasted good friends who are living. And we do that in church every week, you know, twice. Even when we don't have communion, we toast one another. May the peace of Christ be with you, we say. That's a kind of a toast. And we offer praise and honor and blessing to God again during the offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And so it's not as crazy as it sounds, I don't think, to associate a toast with a doxology, with communion. It's a natural connection to some people. Once at Mayflower Congregational, one of the little kids from like right about there in the pew during communion actually said, to Jesus. And they actually clinked the little communion cups. <laughs> it was great. They giggled and they whispered. And the Reverend Lori Walkie, who was the youth minister at the time, said it was absolutely beautiful. Amen. And that's a sure sign that it all worked right. That communion worked as it's meant to, drawing everyone together to share the holy meal. That little kid's toast helped by drawing everybody together in holy laughter. And saying to Jesus worked as a doxology. Because a doxology is meant to draw everyone together in giving honor to someone. And to give honor to someone is to bless someone. See how it all ties together? It's a blessing, it's doxology, it's a toast. It's... 
Christians have been toasting Jesus since the very beginning. Some scholars say that, say that the Lord's Supper itself as a custom of the church naturally fit with Greek and Roman customs of the day. Believers in this God or that God would get together for a festive meal, or uh, we'd call it a banquet, or if it was small, we'd just say it was a dinner party. And at some point, someone would pour out a little wine as an offering. It's a libation. You may have heard that word. They'd pour out a little wine and say a few words, a prayer, or a toast. To Zeus, to Jupiter, to Caesar, they would say. Well, here's a little more background on toasting. I have to admit where I got this. It's called uh, The Art of Manliness. <laughs> it's a thing online. It, I know, I know. Amidst all the bull, there's some pretty decent stuff, and this is one of the decent things. <laughs> See, to those guys, a toast is a manly thing. Well, I don't mind, just forget that. Full confession is to sourcing, okay. It said, ancient toasters might choose a classic set toast that had been passed down for ages or decide to improvise on the spot. That sounds like prayer, doesn't it? Sometimes we use set prayers and sometimes we pray uh, spontaneously. The Greeks proposed short toasts to fallen comrades, to war, to peace, to leaders, to women, but most common of all to their companions' health. We drink to your health, right? We toast to health. The practice continued in ancient Rome. Now this I know for a fact because I studied it. It continued in ancient Rome and was perpetuated by legislation, which I did not know. The Roman Senate at one point decreed that all citizens were to toast to the health of Emperor Augustus during every meal. I can see that happening. To the emperor? No, the Christians said, to Jesus. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, we have heard. And they said, well, to Jesus, not to Caesar, when they offer the libation. And I don't think it's hard at all to even imagine Jesus looking around at life the way he did. He looked at life as it was playing out around him to find simple things to communicate profound truths, right? He was a frequent dinner guest all the way through the Gospels. He's, he's at dinner with somebody and they're fussing with him or he's holding forth or whatever, you know, they're anointing his feet, a woman is anointing his feet with oil at a dinner party. No doubt he saw libations poured out to Greek and Roman gods or to Caesar himself. And no doubt Jesus heard toasts made in their honor. So keep that in mind. Keep that background in mind when you hear these words from the Gospel of Mark. Then Jesus took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now, didn't he mean that he knew he was about to die, and that his blood would be spilled or poured out on the cross? Yes. But could he have also meant for his disciples to come together and to break bread and to share wine in his name, in his memory, in his honor, to toast him, to bless his name, to do him honor? Not Caesar, not any other false god? Yeah, maybe so. And it became a new custom built upon an old one. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said, and they did. And we do. It brought them together. It brings us together. The Lord's Prayer ends with a toast. It ends with a doxology, which makes it fitting for bringing everyone together in worship. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Doxologies, praise to God, toasts to the holy are scattered all throughout the Bible. Here's an early, early example of such a blessing from Leviticus, of all places. Leviticus. By Moses' brother Aaron, the first high priest. Leviticus 9.22 says, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. He toasted them. It doesn't say what he said. It just says that he did. And to me, that suggests that the act of blessing, the act of praising God, the act of toasting Doing it is more important than doing it eloquently. But such blessings have come down to us with eloquence. 
Here are some familiar ones from the Old Testament, from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And from Psalm 121, 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Can you hear that as a toast? It's a blessing. From Psalm 89, 52. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. In the New Testament, at least four letters in addition to Romans end with doxologies or blessings or toasts. And remember the letters were meant to be read out loud during worship. And it probably led right directly to communion. And so with Holy Communion ahead this evening on the holiest of nights, on Christmas Eve, I propose a round of doxologies, a round of toasts, of prayers of praise. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Romans 16, 27, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Philippians 4.20, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Philippians 4.23, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. 2 Timothy 4.18, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 2 Peter 1, 1 and 2. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours in the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. 2 Peter 3, 18. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Finally, from the tiny letter of Jude, from verse 25. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. You know, I'm getting a little chill because these are old words and we can sit and read them by ourselves in our little quiet places at the house. But the preaching of the word is what God uses to communicate to your heart. And so I hope your hearts are tingling and I hope your minds are working. And I hope you're hearing these words afresh because this is what this is what the word of God is for us today when it's proclaimed, when it's preached and when it's shared. Now, there's one more thing about toasts or doxologies or blessings. They're not always written down and memorized or learned. Sometimes they do come from the heart. You know, I just lived that, didn't I? <laughs> I just spoke from my heart. Sometimes it happens abruptly. Praise God. Tell it. Preach it. That's real. Whenever it happens. Amen? Amen. 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 Sometimes the best planned round of wedding toasts can be disrupted by an old friend who just has to stand and say a few words. <laughs> We've all been there. And sometimes the best planned order of worship can be disrupted. Formal liturgy left in tatters when another old friend, the Holy Spirit, moves and a congregation just has to praise God. <clears throat> Here are two examples. In 1959, when the United Church of Christ was still coming together, a committee representing the four denominations that were coming together, some congregational and some reformed, some with bishops, some with not, imagine, they're coming together to form a new church. And they presented a statement of faith to the General Synod there in 1959. Now, getting these churches this far had not come without angst and without a little anger and without plenty of humanity. So people, uh, when they presented the statement of faith, people were bracing for a floor fight. Instead, it was read out loud. There was silence and there was no debate. It was approved unanimously. And then people spontaneously burst into singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That is a historical fact, and it gives me chills to think about it. These are liturgical-minded people, right? Everything's written down. 
Everything's planned. Everything decently in order. But when the Holy Ghost says otherwise, bam, the Holy Spirit will use even the liturgy itself spontaneously. I think that's awesome. And here's another example of spontaneous communal doxology. It's group blessing. A toast to justice seemingly proposed by God, God's self, speaking through the Supreme Court of the United States back when the Supreme Court was capable of such. That was an editorial comment. You can choose to take that or leave it. In 1956, Professor Sally Brown of Princeton reports that weary demonstrators in Montgomery were strategizing their next move when somebody burst into the room and declared, God has spoken from Washington, D.C. The Supreme Court had just ruled against segregated seating on buses and other public transportation. And the room, she says, erupted in tears and in laughter and in spontaneous songs of praise to God. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? God, in the voice of that court, proposed a toast. To God be the glory, lift every voice and sing. And they did. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, in the darkest of the night, we wait expectantly for the Christ child and his message, his example, his teachings, and his reign of justice and peace. We will not be afraid. God's voice seems muffled and distorted now in public life. But let us profess the truth even amid a hail of lies. If God be for us, then who can be against us? Let me close with another toast, an ancient prayer of Christians in Turkey, Iran, and South India. To God be glory, to the angels honor, to Satan confusion, to the cross reverence, to the church exaltation, to the departed quickening, to the penitent acceptance, to the sick and infirm recovery and healing, to the four quarters of the world, great peace and tranquility, and on us who are weak and sinful, may the compassion and mercies of our God come continually. Amen and amen.